We appreciate to hear what you have to say. Great. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here with all of you uh, this evening, and I, it's my first time here on your campus. Of course, I've, um, I've heard about NC State for years. I grew up in Maryland and kind of gradually made my way west, and uh, then now I'm back living in Illinois, but it's a great, great engineering community, and I'm always really excited when I can come onto a college or university campus. My, my parents were both teachers and they had met at their college and so it was always a special time as a kid they would take me back and there was never a question of like if you go to college it was always like where and when you go to college and uh, I found just as an adult I've nat I, I'm more conscious of it now but I've naturally gravitated towards always living near a campus so I lived out in California for 15 years and lived about a mile from the UC Berkeley campus and uh, then when I moved out to Illinois, I live now less than a mile from the Northwestern University campus. And I had two years I went and lived in Northern Ireland a couple of years ago uh, as part of my work with Allstate. And I even live near the, what's called the Queens University Belfast campus there. So uh, again, always a lot of great energy. Um, I think it's always, this is, this is where so much important work and thinking starts. And so my goal uh, tonight is just to be here and be able to share a little bit with you about how I apply my engineering and technology knowledge along with many others at Allstate, all in the service of our great Allstate customers, and, uh, and just talk about really kind of how I see us putting together building blocks that help us fulfill a bigger purpose, bigger than ourselves as individuals or even the company as a whole. So you got, you got it right there. Uh, we're the good hands people at Allstate, and kind of our new marketing campaign is about it's good to be in good hands. And let me just tell you a little bit more about Allstate. So we are a huge insurance company. You know us mainly probably for auto and property insurance. There is other insurance we sell. So we sell insurance to small business people for the autos and property that they have for their business. We insure boats and motorcycles and we have renter's insurance. So there's a variety of different kinds of insurance. And we're in some other businesses too. So Roadside assistance, right? Towing when someone's car breaks down. We're a huge provider of that. We do that for some companies like uh, GM and Audi, and also we have our own traditional motor club or people that are insured with us. Um, there's a great app and a lot that's been done there in the mobile area recently to kind of make it a lot easier to track your insurance and where, or track your tow truck when you need it. Or if you don't need a whole tow truck, just get somebody out to bring you gas or jump a battery if you need to. I think we're, right now nationally, we're getting out to people in about 28 minutes, which is about twice as fast as our competitors do. So um, again, we've got other areas of business and we're the Allstate Corporation and we're known for years as the, the Good Hands brand was started in 1931. But we also have a couple other brands of insurance we sell. So you may have seen ads or maybe have experience with eSurance as another insurance brand. That's owned by Allstate. There's another one that's not quite as well known called Encompass uh, Insurance, which is another great provider through independent agents. So, you know, we're, we're all about uh, protecting people from life's uncertainties and helping restore when something bad happens. And we're the number one publicly held company. There are other insurance companies that are privately held. As a publicly held company, that gives us a lot of uh, visibility and obligation out to the public and our shareholders for how we manage the company. Uh, amazing scale, so the roots in 1931, if you think about it, that was an era when the car was really, really becoming mainstream, right? You, people have been buying cars for a while, but it was really just starting to get into the main. And in, uh, in the Chicago area where I live now, I live like up north of the city, and you know, back then a lot of executives lived there, and the offices were downtown, and they would take the train every day. So a group of guys sitting around on the train that would talk and one of them said, you know, this car thing's getting pretty big, maybe we should start offering insurance for it. And it actually grew out of the Sears, Sears Roebuck company that all states started selling insurance. So from this small vision of a couple people on a train, you know, now we hear all the 
stories of how things started with, uh, with this era of companies, right, back of the napkin and the like. That's the equivalent Allstate story to grow to over $36.5 billion in revenue, number 81 on the Fortune 500. And the big thing that we really keep in, in our minds and hearts is there's 16 million households. We have over 22 million insurance policies. So the real people uh, at the end of the line there that are trusting us and asking us to insure their cars and their homes and other parts of their property. That's really the core of what we're all about with the good hands. And I'm going to tell you more about that in a bit. A great thing I love about being part of Allstate is the sense of also giving back to the communities where we live and work. So that's a huge part of what we do. We have a national campaign against domestic violence called the Purple Purse Campaign. If you haven't heard of that, you might see we did a partnership with Lyft this year where we put out some ads and some awareness. There's an interesting spot if you look up uh, Purple Purse where they did a little thought experiment of what happens if someone found a phone and a purse in a Lyft uh, driver. So, so much great stuff. Again, a wonderful company that's been around right, for over eight decades now. Tremendous success. And then challenging in this new era, challenging ourselves to uh, not just live in an industry that's being disrupted, but be disruptors ourselves and reinvent our business model as things go forward. And that's really what I found very compelling when about six and a half years ago, I started looking at Allstate and decided to join the company. I've been in technology all my life. Um, I grew up just the computer geek at the right time that computers started coming into schools. Um, some of the early computer, one of the first early computer in my uh, elementary school is out there in a display case I was looking at. And uh, I've al I always loved technology, but also was seeking way to be part of teams and organizations and build things for um, for people to use and apply, and so I've been really lucky throughout my career to find different ways and places to do that. And like I said, now I've been doing that with Allstate for about the past six and a half years. And let me tell you just a little bit more, again, about what this really means to us to be the good hands. A few weeks ago, I was uh, sitting down doing some stuff on a weekend, uh, and it flashed up on the TV through the news, and they were like, oh, the, I think it was the mayor of Raleigh is like out on the streets telling people to get off the streets because of the big snowstorm, right? You guys had a pretty big, pretty big weather event. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so glad my talk isn't this week because I kind of did think I'd be coming down here to escape the Chicago winter weather and maybe today it wasn't exactly what I expected, but there was some beautiful sunshine. Um, so our mission in claims, so when you think of insurance and you see the advertising, right, a lot of it is to buy the insurance and buy the protection. A claim is what happens when now something's happened and you need to call upon that promise to get restored. And so this is what we view as our claims mission. We're, we're the good hands and we restore customers' lives after the unexpected happen. And that unexpected runs a whole gamut, right? It can be something sad, a sad day but fairly simple, like you back your car uh, into a fire hydrant, right? You do damage to the car, but maybe the fire hydrant's okay, so you need to get your own car fixed. To so things that are much bigger events that affect many more people, like the hurricanes, right, that happened at the end of last year that you saw in Texas and Florida and the flooding. So there's a whole range of things that can happen to our customers, and again, we're in claims all about living into that promise. And that's a very, like, personal thing. Again, if you were one of the folks uh, out here, this isn't, isn't too bad a carnage. I saw some worse pictures from a few years even further back locally here with some of your snowstorms. But you know, you know when, when things like this happen and people uh, either can or won't you know, stay in and, and be able to avoid everything, car, car accidents happen, uh, sometimes trees fall down, power lines fall down, homes are damaged. We're all about being there for what we call fast, fair, and easy to get you back on the road. What that means if you've never had to file an insurance claim. So first, in today's world, you still need to notify us that something's happened. My goal is in the future to get to the point that we check on you when we know something might have happened, right? More and more sensors all the time. How do we harness those sensors to check in with you if you've got the app on the phone and ask you? But today, again, you get in touch with Allstate. You can uh, do that through, if you've got a great relationship with your local agent, a lot of agents are available and on call and can demystify the process. Or uh, there's a general phone number you can call and one of our other colleagues will help you. But increasingly, we're enabling you more too. Now you could do it from our mobile app on your phone 
or if you're at a desktop or a laptop, we have self-service that you can initiate that process. So you let us know something happened, what happened. Um, I unfortunately had a claim this year. I was traveling for business in Ireland and I uh, had some friends staying at my house because I have a couple dogs that I really love and they were taking care of my dogs. And in the middle of the night in Ireland, the phone rang and uh, a skunk got into my house and sprayed my dog and sprayed my house, unfortunately. Luckily in my basement, so my friends had to take my dogs and move out of my house. And luckily they went back to their apartment, their small apartment with my dogs. But after about a week of denial, like I realized even me in the insurance business, like I was kind of like, I don't know about filing a claim. It's a really scary thing. And I don't know, is it gonna be more expensive than what help I'm gonna get? But finally I was like, all right, it's time to like step up and file the claim. And I have, so I own my home. I have a homeowner's policy with Allstate. And fortunately, it was covered for a skunk coming in and spraying. So I tell Allstate what happens. And then they send these other wonderful people come out and they set up, uh, this is actually, while I was still in Ireland, they were able to set up uh, fans and deodorizers. And well, that's a whole separate story. They eventually had to, they had to rip the carpet out of the basement and throw some stuff away and send some stuff to the cleaner. But again, by, by virtue of having the insurance policy, uh, now I'm collecting all the premiums I paid and the goodwill of Allstate to take care of me, right, and get my basement back. And if you had a car accident, again, we want to get your car on the road as quickly as possible. So whether it's something, again, happening here locally or, like I said, even the, the big events. And this picture, I always love this picture because it really does uh, bring home for me kind of the, like the real trust that customers put in us. It can sometimes when you're working in technology, right, because I don't, I am a customer, but I don't, I don't talk with real live customers every day about their immediate claim problem. In technology, I'm either making sure the systems that I have that are operational today are fully available. So 24 by seven, if someone calls about the next skunk gate, uh, they get a call and they can file things in the system or you know, anything else that things are performing, that they're scaling well, if you're supposed to get a payment, all of that goes well. Or I'm thinking about designing this next generation of systems so that the next person that has a claim, it can be an even better experience. And I don't see customers every day. And it is really good for me um, to go out among customers or to even see pictures like this and remind myself of what it's like for our customers um, who have these, these bad things happen. And, you know, here's a case to me, I think this just goes beyond beyond words, but you can see this couple standing here and, you know, it basically looks like pretty much everything, everything they've owned, right, has just been torn to shreds. This is from a tornado that hit a few years ago. So these are actual customers and this is one of my Allstate colleagues out on the scene. And the thing that always hits me here is when I look behind and then you see even the truck like is smashed up and the windshield is smashed and just to think about, you know, thank God it's never happened to me, but if you woke up one morning or or you in the middle of the night and this thing was happening and then next thing you know, right, your, li your life is around you in shambles. And so we've historically, even before, because again, we started in 1931 and we built over time, but even before technology was so integral to what we did, the customer came first and there were a lot of manual ways to deal with things, but we were very effective and known in the industry for being out there and being on site. And I have colleagues who've been in the business longer than I have who told me they remember like when the first printers were introduced and being mobile and being able to go out to these sites so that the whole idea is, right, if something like this has happened, there's so much you have to think about. We want to be there to help think and provide for you. And so when these massive events happen, whether it's the hurricanes or the tornadoes, we have teams, we call them cat teams for catastrophe. And when a weather event's going to come ahead of time, we have these tractor trailers we built. They have um, satellite communications on top of them. They have generators in them. So if a town has been struck by a tornado, often we're able to roll in very quickly afterwards to set up in a parking lot to have customers again come in. They can use some iPads. They could check in on Facebook and let, let family know they're safe. Because again, if this has happened right, you don't have any, there's not much internet service around. There may not be cell service around. Your power is gone at your house. We roll in and we enable that. We enable them to file the claim. We, for a long time now, have been able to give people debit cards right on the spot. So that's pretty meaningful. Like if, you're, if your house wasn't demolished like this, but you have a hole in your roof and it's gonna leak in, the more you can minimize the damage, the better for you, the better for the company. So 
We can hand people like a $500 debit card and say, you know, you can get some tarps, you can get some equipment. We have, with people's policies, they may have uh, living expenses, so we get people sorted out, get them to the hotel, get them taken care of. And like I said, for years and years, this has been what Allstate, like this is our hallmark of our brand to go in and really take care of people in the moment of truth. And it's what's led us to have very, very loyal customers um, for a very long time and very strong satisfaction. More and more, right, you can see the opportunity to bring in different, different digital enhancements to the customer experience or even remake the customer experience so this is even faster and easier and things you shouldn't have to think about or repeat or worry about are taken care of because of the technology in the background. And if it's something simple, again, like you back into, you back into a fire hydrant, you may just be embarrassed and not even want to talk to someone. You can, you can handle most of that online now. When something like this happens, we always want like, the person to be out there for that human touch in the moment. But there's a lot of technology, again, behind them so that the technology is taking care of, of those things and they can really focus on the person-to-person -person interaction with our customers. So always keeping that, right, that customer centricity, that you could call it user experience, but it goes, I think, deeper than that when something's happened, really informs more and more how we conceive of, design, define the problems we're trying to solve, and then how we apply and integrate the technology to build solutions for claims. And we've had, we've had a few really, really good years of it, and I'll, I'm going to give you some examples of some of the innovations we've brought out and how we think about uh, bringing even more to the fore. First, a little bit conceptual now. This is, is kind of not really comprehensive, but this was some of my brainstorming examples of thinking about. I thought it might be good for us to talk a little bit about um, whether you're from the engineering school or you're coming from another discipline. And this, this power I found in the world is to be able to connect different problem sets and solution spaces together to really have impact. And so this is a diagram I did a little while ago within Allstate to talk about how we think about some of that. As a company, as an ongoing business, right, we have a set of corporate priorities. And I have a little different version of our good hands here. This is our whole corporate purpose. So before claims is about restoration, and the whole big picture is we help customers realize their hopes and dreams by providing the best products and services. That's, again, at all kind of points in the life cycle, including claims. So we also have a corporate goal, right? We run a business. So the business is really there because and for the people and caring about people to put them in good hands. And it is an ongoing business concern that aims at continuing to be a profitable enterprise. So our corporate goal is to create long-term value, serving our, our, stake, our stakeholders, taking appropriate risks, and leveraging our capabilities and our strategic assets. And more and more, again, our technology is a strategic asset. That's, again, part of what attracted me to Allstate is when I, uh, when I was coming in, there was a real awakening and realization from our CEO and board of directors on down that world-class technology can fuel a world-class insurance company and take it really beyond that to the next level. That's really, really different. You would not have found that like maybe even a decade ago within a CEO of an insurance company talking as much about technology as you hear now. So our CEO was at uh, the CES show out in Vegas a couple weeks ago and he was on TV um, doing various press shows and again talking about digital technology uh, the power to really change things, the power to help, help consumers and change the whole dialogue. Again, for me, that's a really powerful thing because when I started out as an engineering student, the model was always engineering students going to work for engineering companies, right? Maybe an aerospace company or something, but it was always like very like direct, the tech that then got sold to someone else running a business that served everyday customers more and more in the world, right, companies, and you guys have probably seen it if you've been out looking at internships or jobs or at different talks, really see there are all different types of companies that are looking for technologists because technology is a core asset and capability. And so as I think about on the left, these corporate priorities we have, again, they're very kind of more economic, a view of running the whole business. And I think about the technological forces of change. Again, there are so many, but I just listed a subset. Things that I see we can really bring in and integrate to affect us. 
mapping them together, we have these innovation targets, things we're actively working on now. Again, it's not a complete list, but some of the things you'll hear us out talking about, really looking the future for multi-cloud capability, like many companies saying it's no longer just operating within the bounds of our own own data centers where we've been in the past. How do we look to exploit that in the future? How do we, how do we use where we can use third-party software, let that again run outside of our data center? Part of that is we build a lot of our own software because there are things where, thing, where we can use things off the shelf, we want to use it, but there are also things that are very unique to our scenarios and business cases. So we've been investing a lot in uh, teaching people to work in a cloud native environment and starting to take a Microsoft, microservices approach and building out APIs. And again, things hopefully, this is all you guys that are the computer science and engineering students, it's kind of bread and butter of your curriculum today but it's part of a larger shift of companies, 80-year-old companies starting to make and adapt and adopt and it allows us to be more nimble when we get new business opportunities going forward. So different ways of partnering. And then within all of this in a really large enterprise, engineering standards and governance are a really important thing. It's not a word I heard at least a lot academically about governance. I knew about maybe good standards or principles. But within a really large company, when there are di many different parts working together, you want to work quickly, but also ensure things can interoperate. Because if I'm one customer at the end of the day dealing with 10 different departments, I don't want to feel like I'm dealing with 10 different departments. I just want to feel like I've got one company that's got my back. Right? So a lot of different opportunities, again, to me, uh, it's all about taking the exciting stuff that's been happening that builds upon decades of work and applying that to the corporate priorities and then serving that customer there in their time of need. And in another sense, again, within the company, it also means there's a lot of change that we can really capitalize on. So the forces of change, one of the things that insurance historically was not really high transaction with our customers. If you take out an insurance policy, it renews about every six months. So if the system could work to give each person a good experience every six months, like, quote, this is what your insurance is going to cost, this is what coverage you get, sign on the dotted line, we can take your payment and move on. And hopefully it's a really rare case that, that a customer has a claim, right? It's not like checking your Facebook a bunch of different times. Like, hopefully, hopefully you don't have to have any claims. I went many years without having one. Uh, before I had one. When you do, then you want to pretty frequently know what's happening. And that's a sea change of dynamic, again, because in the old days, it's like you would say, well, I had some damage, now everything goes into a black hole, and if I'm lucky, they told me in two weeks, I'll hear back, and I hear back, or I start asking in two weeks. Now, with enabling self-service and monitoring of capabilities, we're driving more and more transactions with people. We have a... Uh, we have a telematics, which is telematics, you know, is where we're, we're using the telemetry in the car to track how people drive. We've been out in the market for that a, a long time now, billions of miles of data of how people drive. And so that's an example now of if you're using the DriveWise app that, that we use for the Allstate brand. We have it branded elsewhere for our other brands. But if you're using DriveWise, and you can start that app whenever you get in the car, you get benefits of from Allstate for it, and you're interacting with Allstate a lot more frequently. Again, down at the core technology level, that model really radically changes how we need to think about our systems and scalability of our systems. From 16 million customer households doing a few transactions with me now and then, to you know, millions of drivers transacting with me every minute of every day. It's a really like, a, it's a huge like step change thing mentally to think about with our systems. And part of that then is needing to drive down the transaction costs and being able to enable some of the models like cloud hosting to do that where we're just paying for the capacity we need. Traditionally, we've like overcapacitized, and I used to work at a bank as well, and it was the same thing. Like you overcapacitize for the times that there might be peak demand. You know, at the bank, it can be a time of financial fluctuation in the economy. In insurance, it can be a time, right, there's been a big natural disaster. All of a sudden, you're really going to exercise the systems. You were paying a lot of money to have a lot of excess capacity that you might use now and then. Now, if we can horizontally scale, right, and only pay what we consume, we can get a lot of efficiency there to better run the company. And again, really being available uh, to the customer. 
It used to, again, be people transacted mainly through their agents, and if something wasn't working, they could kind of tap dance a little bit and kind of talk to you and get everybody to be really comfortable. Now, you know, we all know we have a, a kind of really fundamental expectation that if you want to log on and check the status of your claim, you can get that anytime, and there's not really any excuse for not having it available. So there's a lot of powerful forces we can leverage, but it also meets where you're sitting in industries like this where there's a lot of uncertainty. What's going to happen? We talk a lot within the company, right? Our, our bread and butter of our revenue is auto insurance. So what's happening with driverless cars? What's happening with ride sharing? What's happening with fewer people owning cars? What does it mean with the automakers putting more sensors in the car? Will they start underwriting and insuring the car? There are all these really fascinating questions coming up that inevitably will affect our business and present uncertainty. But again, our goal is to be on top of that by leveraging the disruption and new business models so that we're out there and being very dynamic to meet everyone's needs as things come about. And again, what I really love, being a tech geek all of my life, is that technology is so core to doing all this. I don't see any new business model we're thinking about as a company that doesn't have some element really at its core that we have to think about like true digital reinvention, not just like you used to do something on paper, now you can do it on the computer. That was kind of like the first 20 years or so, right, of computers coming into companies. It just sort of replaced or made like incremental efficiency on tasks. Now we can really take a, a huge leap forward. So let me tell you a little bit more about um, what we've been doing, but, but before I do, I want to just touch on this theme, and this is another kind of slide where I thought there was so much I could put on it, but it's just sort of for illustration purposes. But really fundamental to me is this whole, this whole notion that everything are building blocks upon building blocks upon building blocks. And I think that's really important for you to realize, like particularly those of you that are early in your career, right, to understand how work you will start doing early on can seem sometimes, sometimes for me, it always felt in school, in some of the early work I did, it felt very insignificant compared to like the idols of engineering and computer science and business that I studied, right? It always felt like I'm just learning such small things. My, uh, after my freshman year at computer engineering at Carnegie Mellon, I got a summer internship and I was uh, a C programmer in a natural language processing lab. And man, I was well. I wasn't a very good like summer intern to begin with. I have to admit, but uh, it was a good life experience for me. But I remember like at the time, it was all coming into the job, and they at, at that so at that time, uh, at at that stage of natural language processing, it was just about trying to create effective parsers and starting to just go through a lot of published works and trying to get the computer to be able to sort out you know what were verbs and adjectives and ambiguous sentences and things like that. And now when I like stand in my kitchen and I'm like talking with my Alexa and I just think, well, like it's crazy. Alexa can do all these things that I remember all these years ago, like just banging my head against the table, like trying to get a parser to work to see if it could even understand something small. And now not only like does the natural language processing work, but the voice recognition is at the point that it does that, and the web services are so integrated that it can call a new app. And um, again, it's, it's, it's overwhelming to me the progress we make you know, every few months, every year, not to think on a decade basis. But then I also have to remember, you know, I was in some very small way part of that, even as a student contributing in the lab I worked for and the research I was part of, to all these building blocks that had to come together to realize these commercial products. I think that's a theme where um, there are, again, amazing people and figures we study about the iconic figures in tech that have created great things. I also just think it takes all of us creating our piece of things to be able to stand back and realize that we've built upon this body of knowledge that builds upon the past decades and bodies of knowledge. So um, I get Again, I think it's just really exciting to, to think about that as you think about each small thing you're doing will be part of a collective mass of work that's going to keep revolutionizing how we work. And so by, by building on the past, we've been able to do some really interesting things for claims customers. So parts of the country, I think not so much here, but I, I lived in Oklahoma for a while. I was in the Air Force and I got stationed there. Like Oklahoma, 
Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, they're, they're states that come spring, they are known for really bad hailstorms. I don't know if anybody's ever been in a really bad hailstorm. Growing up in Maryland, we would occasionally see like hailstorms. Uh, but there are parts of the country where they get these like softball sized pieces of hail. You see incredible pictures of not just autos damaged, but like the, the sides of houses I saw this spring. And again, when this happens, it's not, uh, it's, it's not exactly rocket science what needs to happen. Like if, if a lot of cars are outside and they're damaged, they, people need to have a claim. We need to do our part to pay them the money. They need to get to a shop and get the dents taken out and the glass taken back in. What it, it's more of an operational planning problem classically, like how many people need services in one area? How many people do we have or can we get to one area that traditionally could look at that damage? Again, we were, we've been industry leading for decades and, and very efficient at setting up, like let's get people on site and there would be, you know, uh, all states set up a temporary claim center at this parking lot, bring your cars and go through. And again, leading, industry leading for years. But then you start thinking about some of these new capabilities. Well, do I need a person to set their eyes on and walk all around the vehicle? We partnered with a company that built this uh, it's kind of a, a dark photo, but you can see a car in it. And we, for a while, we were using this. Um, it was uh, basically think of it's like a scanning room, but it's mobile. So it would go on a tractor trailer bed out to a site. It would expand a bit. It would create a light proof chamber. Someone drives their car into it. We seal it up. 250 sensors perform a two minute scan of the entire vehicle surface detect the dents and damage and what size it is, put that into like all of our classic knowledge we can kind of codify about how much it costs to repair different types of damage to different parts of the vehicle, and you can just spit out an estimate. And so this is a, a project we did a couple years ago where we built a mobile app that would take the output of these sensors, um, again, lay it against the model of your, your make and model of car, and generate a kind of an invoice type of, for legal reasons, we weren't allowed to call it an estimate, but basically kind of give the rough estimate of what you needed to do to get your car repaired. So you can start to see the, the potential there for this huge efficiency of taking what even a pretty efficient person walking around would have to do in terms of manual marks that had to be transcribed and put into the system to scanning, automation, taking it down to minutes, really starting to use the technology. And again, great experience for our developers to get to build cloud native, build an app, get it deployed. Um, lots of fun to work on projects like this. So the team that was writing the app, I remember talking to them one day and they had gone down to uh, St. Louis, Missouri where we had a facility where there are cars that have been totaled and they got to take hammers and like bang up a car and then scan it, right? And see, see what that was like. I use this as an example because I thought another point that's good to share is about uh, even in companies when we make an investment in doing something new, we are more and more focusing on the principle of to get validated learning and to let that move on. So I think even a few years ago, the attitude was more prevalent. Like, boy, if we're going to pay to build something, this better be something we are going to use for a number of years to like get our money's worth. Uh, now, we obviously want to get our money's worth, but we see it a little bit differently. Like if we learn, and then by learning, we can determine there's an even better way, it's not so bad to not use something again. So we use this for a hail season. Again, it got, got great reviews, uh, great feedback from customers, great feedback from the users, and then started thinking about like, well, but it is kind of expensive to have this big tractor trailer, light proof, sensor driven thing that has to go to site. Is this really the best way, right? There's, a, there's always, almost always more than one way to solve a problem. And so we moved away from this a bit and more into the notion of virtual estimating. We want to do that through automated means, but also realizing kind of in the interim, it's not so bad to have a person's eyes on it. We realize operationally where most of our money and time goes is transporting the people to get their eyes on the vehicle. So what if we can put eyes on the vehicle and bring the images to the people and let them be in one location? So instead of taking people from Texas and sending them to Florida for that hurricane, how can I get them images while they sit in Texas to do everything they need to do to serve that customer and complete the claim? So 
this is switching from car back to house, and then I'll take you back to the car for a moment. Um, it's, we've really gotten into what we call, again, virtual estimating. And you can see, again, this is just a building block, and there'll be more advancements in the future. But what we're working on is this little picture of a home and thinking about between inside and outside the home, how do we use aspects of technology and emerging technology to do an even better job of restoring people when something happens. So we're using drones. We use a third-party drone provider. Uh, they can come, come to the house. We only do it with people's permission because of privacy concerns today, right? Not everybody wants a drone flying around their property. People have different feelings about it. Um, you know, I, my friends are more of the camp, like, oh my God, if a drone's coming out, let's throw a party, take the day off, have everybody <laughs> out, like, let's check this out. But not everybody feels that way. So again, kind of being sensitive to the user base. But they can come out with a drone, uh, fly a seven minute flight path around the house, create a 3D model, be able to zoom in on particular damage. Again, put that against systems we've developed over the past years of what materials and work it'll take to fix something. The drones are huge too, because we used to, um, and we still do in some areas, but send people up on a ladder. So again, the more we can have people be safe and not have them at risk, that's a great advantage. There are also, with the hurricanes, we did 13% uh, of the house estimates were done just using virtual imagery, and we can use some uh, more like fixed wing, low flying imagery, or, or use before and after imagery of an area to detect claims. Particularly if people have been evacuated from the area and no one's at home, the quicker, again, we can detect and let them know and start getting them through the process to get restored. Virtual assist, which I'll talk more, it's we're using it in the car and the home and finding new uses for it. It's just a, it's a, it's a way of videoing from person to person, again, to do the estimate. So everybody doesn't need to be physically in one space. When we started this, we built, a, we built an app that's been so successful that we've spun it out to another company we have, and they're starting to sell it to others in the insurance and the automotive industry, which... For me, again, is really exciting to think like, you know, I thought for years I was building something for the company to use and now to have actually built something that other companies want to buy in addition to being of value for my company. Uh, I'll tell you more about virtual assist in a minute, but one of, the, one of the interesting things is, you know, when we started building it, a lot of the business folks were like, yeah, I don't get it. Like, why don't you FaceTime? Why don't you Skype, right? It's just me calling you like here, you know, people are like, here, let me get my phone. I'll just show you how this works right now. But the reality when you're running a business like ours is it's not as simple. Like, yes, that works really well if I know you can do my estimate and I can just call you and you're available. But, but it's a many-to-many -many problem, right? Hundreds and thousands of people have video that they want to have someone look at. And there are many people that can look at the video, but sometimes you need someone who's specialized in a particular area. So there's routing and workflow and queuing and saving the work. And that's what we've really built is it's all about uh, being able to establish a video link but provide a really good end-to-end -end experience so it's tied to your claim damage, it's tied to your estimate, if it gets dropped you can reconnect. Many different aspects that add value on us building something uh, beyond what we've, what we've bought in a person-to-person -person video third-party product. And then we're looking at other apps again to help inside the house be able, there's all kinds of things emerging, right, with visual recognition and analytics and the ways to record things so that you can just more quickly uh, understand where there's damage. Or if you've had water damage in your home, traditionally they might have come in and told you in your kitchen, we're not sure there could be mold behind the counter, there could not be, we're going to have to rip it all out and check it. And then that's a lot of hassle, right? It's a lot of money, it's time, you don't have your kitchen, it's a lot of hassle. Now with thermal imaging, you can get a pretty good idea, is there water behind the area or not? There's, what to do? Good. So, I'll, so this, like I said, the Virtual Assist app, if we get the slides back up, I'll show you just a couple more slides from our website of what we're doing with that, but it's, um, it's again, it's, it's one problem that you can articulate from a, how do we again take out the operational costs of people that need to be um, need to be going from place to place or spending a lot of I'll call it unproductive time right because they're just in transit to get to see the next set of damage um, to being able to to get this in a moment's notice and keep and do many more in a day so. 
there's this live video app, but there's also capturing photos, and, and they're both a really kind of similar storyline for what we're saying. So let me, let me, it's kind of best to explain to you if a year ago you had had, let's say, a fender bender where you could still drive your car. Once again, we're very, very proud to lead the industry with a lot of great technology and a lot of great customer service. And, it, and we would say in seven to eight days, you're going to have a check in your hand and you can have your you know, car being repaired at the repair shop. And that was really, really good performance. Today, if the same thing happens to you, it's less than 15 hours. So that's huge for us to go from seven to eight days to less than 15 hours. And it was just over an hour the person I've seen it happen the fastest. Someone called us to say this had happened to their car. They had a smartphone. They took the photos on the spot. They gave us their debit card number. We have a thing called reverse debit. With just your debit card number, we can put money in your account. And while they were still on the phone, they were like, wow, I see the money there. And then the video helps us now. When, you're, when you take your car in after this has all been estimated, one of people's fears is, well, what if there's more damage? You know, Allstate paid me $1,500. But what if the car shop says it's 2000 Am I going to, I don't have $500 to pay the difference. And we cover that difference, but again, traditionally things were trapped in a body shop. Like the body shop would be working on your car, they'd maybe take off the bumper, they see more damage. They're like, oh, we need to get somebody from Allstate out here. They would write it up, still use fax machines, they'd fax it over. Somebody at Allstate, like, have you checked the fax? Like, there's a big pile. And it would, sometimes it would be a couple days. And so the body shop's like, well, while we're waiting to hear from Allstate about your car, we're, you know, we moved it out into the lot and we're fixing someone else's car. Now with the video, they can just, again, real time, on demand, get us. We can look at the damage. We can authorize them to keep working. Your car doesn't get out of the queue. You get it back a few days earlier. It's cheaper for us. It's better for you. Again, it's all enabled by these different point changes that um, in, and, in and of themselves, some of them are more interesting. Others are a little bit more pedestrian. Where I've really found the power these past few years is in integrating these together. And so uh, you know, on the Allstate website, there's, you know, there's just more information. But it's pretty simple. And what we found is, again, driving organic user growth. We had a controlled kind of rollout and marketing across the country in different areas of different states to body shops. And we started just getting calls from all over the country by body shop people that had just found this app and downloaded it and wanted to try it. And again, that's when I feel too, you know, you're building good tech when there's that people are pulled to it. They don't, you don't have to push it on them. So I just wanted to circle back again. I think um, it's really important always to recognize the contribution of individuals, of institutions, whether it's, you know, a great university like this, whether it's a company like Allstate, great contributions. And then together we're changing industries and communities and, uh, and I think it's additive to this great cycle of change we're seeing in the world. So as you can tell, hopefully I'm pretty excited to be part of it. I want to leave a little time now to uh, take your questions. And so I'll just leave you just sharing some of my principles for success that uh, my, my team and I share. We have a mantra we've been using to say, be excellent engaged engineers who build, improve, and support awesome software for our business and customers. Again, keeping in mind that tie of the customer, the technology, and the corporate mission, and really thinking about how do we work together in a cross-functional, more boundaryless way to create this experience and keep improving on it. So, thank you. Who's got a question? All right. So, um, wait until you get the microphone, and that way we capture your question on video. Okay. Our winner from earlier. <laughs> First of all, thank you for being here with us and sharing your amazing experience. And what I really appreciate most is you emphasize the link between technology and business. And then in your case, the people. Uh, and 
and I, I think it's important, like the ability to look beyond the technology into the business side is important, and that's why I want you to ask this you this question. Uh, you started with a engineering tech background. Uh, at at one point, you decided to pursue your MBA. Uh, what happened during your mind in your mind during that time? Like what made you made that decision to go from one tech background to uh, MBA, pursue an MBA, uh, which is a business Yeah, that, that was a, a big decision for me. And, and personally, it's been really good. Like, I'm glad I did it, uh, both for how I've applied it in my work, but also I think just personally for me as a lifelong learner, I really enjoyed being back in the, uh, in the university environment for that period of time. And for me, it was a matter of having, again, come up through an engineering background and been really comfortable with technical things. And then as I, as I got into doing technology in the business world and I started moving up into management, I did well at learning from mentors and through other programs about basic finances and what you needed to do uh, to manage a team. But I started, as the further up I got, I realized like I don't really understand the guts of what makes a company run with profit and I decided that I wanted to go back to school. I did a program that was for uh, full-time working professionals, and so it was a program that was structured, at, uh, clustered in a way that I, I kept working, but I could go and really learn, and I definitely know I picked the right career for myself, and I would never want to be an accountant, but I did like pass the accountant, uh, the MBA accountant exam and uh, corporate finance, and I, I, like I said, it was, a re it was a really good exposure, and it also said to me, like, yes, my home's in tech, but I can communicate, I feel more effectively now, like with the uh, presidents of companies and other people about where do they want to take their business, and I'm, I'm better able to position how can we assist that with technology. Thank you. Got someone over on the end, right? Two questions, if that's all right. They'll be quick. Uh, uh, Self-driving cars that don't have accidents, does that decimate your automobile insurance business? That's the first question. And the other one is, if you're going to empower me to report my own damages, a tornado hits my neighbor's house, I go over there, take pictures of it, and, and make a claim. So there's fraud. How, how are you going to handle that? Two very good questions. So the there's not a... There's not a clear answer on the first part, the auto with the self-driving automobile, um, but it's a fascinating space that we could debate forever, and people debate a lot, what time horizon will it be changed? But what we do know, and inevitably it will change the, the dynamics for us, and it will change things from the traditional way we offer auto insurance. Uh, but there are interesting sub-questions in there, so um, will, will the cars really not have accidents? Maybe, maybe not, right? We're still learning through the example and the tech is still coming up. And then um, even if the cars don't do things, what, what other things will happen that you still need insurance for, uh, you know, someone running in front of the car or, you know, some other kind of physical damage and then who should provide that insurance and who can do it and be profitable at it. So there are all kinds of really interesting questions. I know, I know some people, not so much a corporate position, but as I go and I talk with other people, there's also this sense of um, the way insurance today is, is about you're insuring the things that you own, um, but really isn't there a thing that we all want kind of our lifestyle insured? So like what will the future equivalent be that kind of protects you? Like we're, we're seeing more and more where a traditional part of auto insurance coverage was rental car coverage. Like if my car's in the shop, I want a rental car. Um, I've had that before, I like, wasn't really super impressed with the rental car they gave me and it maybe wasn't that convenient and could be a headache to return. And so now people are thinking about models like, well, what if we gave you some Uber or Lyft credits or credit from a different rideshare company, right? Would you be just as happy to take money and figure out how you're going to get around for a few days than to do that? Or also looking at different ways to have different types of coverage. And then uh, fraud, yeah, fraud is an excellent space. So. Uh, fraud in the insurance industry is a big problem. It's one of those kind of uh, unknown knowns. So we know we have fraud and we extrapolate and try to figure out how much we have, but the, the best part of it you don't, you don't detect. 
Um, I've been in a partnership with some academics at Queen's University of Belfast for a few years um, where they're applying machine learning and link analysis to build different fraud detection patterns. Uh, more uh, for the example you cited of like taking photos of the neighbor's house, we're looking at how do we use uh, metadata. And it also is where sometimes today like we put a person in the middle still so that it's not just you. But we want to figure out again the way to make it easier and easier for legitimate people to have claims while circumventing the fraud. And so, you know, there's, so there's fraud investigation in a number of different areas going on. We've been partnering with a, a startup that does social media investigation. So in other words, can we either figure out if, you, if you're in a car accident and you have a claim for whiplash, but you're you know, posting pictures of you pole dancing, uh, you know, maybe that calls into question your, your claim. On the other hand, like sometimes you can see clearly from people's postings, they, their life really is affected. And, it is a very legitimate uh, claim. So it's, I think it's fascinating because to me, I also think just like in banking or other areas, like the people that commit fraud will keep running to catch up. You know, it's like, it's like a, a race that we'll keep getting in, but it's kind of an exciting one to think about how do, you, how do you do that? Because there's a lot of cost you could take to all of us that buy insurance policies. You could take a lot of cost out if there wasn't the fraud in it, right? Because to some degree, everybody's paying for the bits of fraud that leak out in the system. Um, how about cyber insurance? Is Allstate thinking about getting into cyber insurance at all? You know, with such a big company, I'm not always sure what all of my colleagues are doing at any one moment. So um, I haven't heard of like a, a near-term element on that, but I know that's a big thing for small business owners and others, and it's a really huge market segment that's increasing. So, um, so another question is, seems like with autonomous vehicles, the, the quality of the software will determine whether there's accidents, accidents or not. So is there any communication with the auto manufacturers about insurance? Yeah, the, the quality of the software and the quality of the sensor data too, right? I think right now we see where you're hindered sometimes by sensor data like in the uh, rain or snow when light refracts differently, it affects the, uh, the sensor capability. And we are, we are members of various industry consortiums. So yes, there's a lot of industry collaboration that happens to say how do we make things safer and, all states got a history of that. Like we were, we were instrumental in introducing the three, three point safety belt, and there are things that manufacturers and insurers kind of get coupled together to hopefully have better and better outcomes. Uh, let me ask one more question about cyber insurance. Uh, let's say. At one time in the future, Allstate jump into cyber insurance. Uh, according to you, what will be the biggest obstacle uh, for Allstate if, if Allstate jump into that business? Which I think that business is, has a huge potential. But in case Allstate jump into that business, what what going to be the biggest obstacle for Allstate? I think it's interesting, right, as a general business question, and to get back to your kind of earlier, this is part of what I felt like I got from my MBA, was thinking about... Uh, what, what gives any given company or brand the, the right to play in, in a particular space? So one of it's like why, in any business we go into, you think like why Allstate and not this company, this company, or this company? I mean, sometimes maybe it's both and you're gonna compete head to head, but like what is the, um, you know, what are the elements? So there's so much goodness in our brand about the good hands people and the, tr the trust that people have in Allstate as a company. Um, but there's, it's one, I think it's, it's one thing like our focus today is in protecting our own corporate borders, right? So that we, uh, you know, are uh, able to defend against denial of service attacks and the systems are available when you need to use them. And we protect your personal information, both your, your payment information, if you've given us that, or if you're a claimant with an injury, we have medical information and we take great care to protect all that within our walls. I think it is a it is a product mindset shift to get them thinking about 
how do you protect individuals from those same sorts of attacks because you're controlling there's different things that you can't control that you can control when it's your corporate boundary. It's kind of an intriguing thing to think about. But. Yeah, I, I see your point. Thank you. I think we're about up. I just have one more Anybody question. Anybody have one more? If there's one lingering. So um, this is a little bit less of a business question, but um, since a lot of us here are students and we're about to be starting our careers and all, what do you think? is the most important things we should be learning and doing in our careers to be successful? I think uh, it's just, it's less than learning a specific thing than keep cultivating the lifelong learning, like just keep learning new things. It's not that like school ends and then, I know when I left school I was eager to apply what I knew, but then there was so much more to learn. And I felt lost the first few years, like leaving school and going into a, like a work environment and understanding uh, when I went into like my first engineering job and all of a sudden like there were all these specifications and there were big design meetings with all these people and it was just like a whole whole different world on how to get into that so I think the more you can be curious and uh, be willing to ask questions and listen and learn like take that you know take the curiosity and the, the great student you've been here within these walls and don't forget to take it out um, in there. But also come into somewhere knowing that you're gonna bring things that other people don't know. Sometimes I see like when people come in new from school and then they're all of a sudden they're working with people that have been around the company for a while and they're like, oh, I can't believe you don't know that because we like, we learned that in our, you know, sophomore class now. But on the other hand, for like everything you know, there's someone else that doesn't know that but they know other things and it's the how do you work together to like close the gap as a team. Well, again, thank you for having me. It's been great to be with you, and uh, I really, really appreciate it and wish you all the best in your semester and your pursuits. Mm -hmm.